Welcome to the Kenosha City Church Podcast. Lead Men's Ministry teaches men how to lead in their family, their workplace, their church, and more. In this message, Kenosha City Church's friend, Ben Segabart, will look at what God has to say about worthless men, their character, and how to avoid becoming one. Enjoy the message. God expects men to lead. God isn't a God that assigns no gender. It's pretty clear. He assigns a gender, and he expects men to, to lead. Um, I was... We were cruising around Kenosha uh, yesterday in Andy's car, and I looked beside me. I was sitting in the passenger seat, and there was a book there that he said that some of you guys are going through together, and it talks about principles of being a godly man. And, and I think what I'm going to share with you this morning is going to fit perfectly with that because this is like the antithesis of the perfect godly man. Today, what we're going to be talking about is worthless men. Worthless men. Um, before I get too far into that, kind of share a little bit of a story. Um, my, my dad died in 2020, kind of unexpectedly. Uh, it wasn't COVID. It, it appears that he had a massive heart attack and, uh, you know, he was on no medication or anything. Really shocked us when that happened. And uh, my dad was a huge influence in my life. Really solid Christian man. Uh, some of you guys, you know, have all kinds of different places for, you know, with a uh, relationship with your dad. Maybe it was awesome. Maybe it was way less than awesome. Maybe you didn't know the guy. I was one of the blessed uh, men who got to know my dad really, really well. So uh, the funny thing about my dad, Andy knew my dad really well too, actually. Uh, When I was, um, I think, living in Omaha, Andy would every once in a while stop out to the farm where my dad was and uh, sit and have coffee with him. And he was one of those guys that was just fun to have coffee with. It kind of pumping up the mentoring thing. Uh, it is good to have a guy that's uh, ahead of you in Christ, so to speak, to sit. And it's not, you know, a bunch of homework and yada, yada. It's just being able to iron sharpen iron, as the scripture says. And One of the things that my dad would do when I was a kid, um, <laughs> he's in the military for quite a while, um, 26 years, I think, and uh, ran a utility. He was over water, sewer, and electric in a utility. So he was a pretty structured guy. He kind of knew uh, what, what he wanted done, uh, but he wasn't overly structured. He also ha- We had a farm. I grew up on a farm. Last house on a dead-end gravel road in Iowa and uh, riding dirt bikes and having tons of fun. But <laughs> I remember as a teenager talking with my dad, and when weekends would come up, he'd say, you know, uh, so what, what you going to do this weekend? You know, I'd say, oh, dad, you know, tonight... I'm going to go out with my buddies. We're just going to, you know, cruise around, kind of see what's going on. And I, I'll never forget, my dad would always, he'd, he'd start out not just what you're going to do this weekend, but what's your plan? He'd say, hey, what's your plan? So I'd start going over, like I said, well, I'm going to go, we'll cruise around, I'll, I'll meet up with so-and-so, and so-and-so, see, kind of see what's going on. He'd just look at me and go, son, that's a terrible plan. <laughs> and it would go like that every single week, you know, at, at least about every other night. Hey, hey, what's your plan? Oh, we're just going to, so, so then I'd modify the plan, you know, it's going to be Jim and John and we're going to go to the movies and, you know, and we'd, I'd start ratcheting it down. He thought a young man with keys and a little bit of money wandering around on a weekend was probably a bad plan, right? <laughs> he was right. Turns out he was right. Uh, I will say that I was on probation most of the my life in high school, I uh, lost my license. Well, I you know, had two DUIs, um, tons of possession charges and all that. I got in a lot of trouble. I got in a lot of trouble. And, and so what I was doing was lying most of the time. And what you find in the scripture is uh, worthless men don't have a plan. And, and if they do have a plan, they're bad plans. As my dad would say, that, that's a terrible plan. And, and we're going to look at some of that today. Um, worthless men. I was talking with somebody, and I would said something about worthless men. And they looked at me, and they said, I think that's a little harsh. And I said, well, you're, you're entitled to that opinion. That's just what God calls them. If God made them, and God loves men with an everlasting love that he gave the Lord Jesus Christ as a substitutionary atonement for the men that were doing the terrible, worthless things. Uh, that he hates so much with with his furious anger, right? Um, God can say, 
hey man, what you're doing, you're a worthless man. And there are other things, other ways that the scripture describes it. Vain men, wicked men, good for nothing men. One of them that I like is empty men. See, the, one of the books that you guys are going through, and as you look through the scriptures, what you'll see is that God defines manhood. Lots of people want to define it for you, and I would say don't go with a worldly definition of manhood. You need to go with God's definition because God made men. God knows what a good and successful man is. And so um, knowing that you guys have gone through so many you know, different uh, definitions of what it means to be a godly man. I thought it'd be fun to look at worthless men. So what, as I'm reading through the scripture for years, I would run into these, this phrase, worthless men. I, I generally read from the New American Standard version of the Bible. And so I'd run into this phrase, worthless men. And there are other translations that use that as well. And, and I thought, I need to study that. And it was some time ago at our, one of our men's ministry things. I thought, I'm going to study what it, what it means to be a worthless man. So you guys are just going to walk with me through a little bit of that. And, and what, I, what I wanted to say is God's man follows God's plan. God's man follows God's plan. Worthless men follow their own plan. We're just going to kind of walk through these bullet points and kind of hop, skip, and jump through here. Usually what I like to do is have a text. We ratchet it in on the text. We stare at it and just break it apart. This is more topical as we talk about worthless men. Look at how interesting it is how God describes worthless men. Worthless men lead you away from serving and following God. Deuteronomy 13, 13. Some worthless men have gone out from among you and have seduced the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods whom you have not known. Worthless men lead you away from following God. If there is a man in your life that believes that God is not real, that God in giving your tithes to a church, giving your time to a church, stopping and praying before a meal is all a bad idea, it's a worthless man by definition. I should say, um, biblically too, before we continue through worthless men, you can't be a man, according to God's definition, if you don't know God. That's interesting, I think. If you don't have a relationship with God, God would look you squarely in the face and say, you're not a man. (laughs) You're not a man as I've defined you. The only way to be a man is to be a godly man. That's the only way. We were created for a relationship with God. So in every way that we fall short in our relationship with God, we're not a man. Uh, Jesus Christ is the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the tip, the, the alpha male, right? He is, he is the quintessential man. And he had an amazing relationship with the father. He says, I and the father are one. But worthless men will lead you away from following God. Worthless men will do anything for money. This is funny because today, things continue, you know, it's like we don't wonder if things are moral or immoral anymore. It's just like, does it make money? Does it make a lot of money? If it makes a lot of money, it's probably good because money is good and I want money. And so we don't even ask the question anymore, you know, from from gambling situations to uh, prostitution, all the stuff that happens online. the question isn't, is it moral? Is it, can I make money? Godly men will do anything for money. Judges 9 4. They gave him secretly, or I'm sorry, they gave him 70 pieces of silver from the house of Bel Berith, which is in Abimelech, hired worthless and reckless fellows, and they followed him. All this guy had to do is hire the guys out. Well, here's some money. All right, let's do it. I think it, it's, it's a tragedy today that men would compromise for money. I could, I could go on on that. Uh, the question isn't, can you make money? I mean, look at the, all the stuff with sports today. And, and everybody says, oh, they can make a lot of money doing that. How many of these admired and admonished athletes are selling their soul for money? And we'd say, well, don't you know? They made three million dollars for that ad, don't you know? They signed a contract for. I don't care what they did. They're not God's man. Sell their soul for money. God's man won't do that. Worthless men will do anything for money. Worthless men are driven by sexual desire. Judges nineteen twenty two. 
While they were celebrating, behold, the men of the city, certain worthless fellows, surrounded the house, pounding the door. They spoke to the owner of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came into your house that we may have relations with him. As you can tell from the text, it's a homosexual relationship that these men are demanding. And, and a worthless man will do anything for sex. And we see, you know, as I just kind of pound it, feel like, you know, good morning, welcome for breakfast, you know. Ben starts <laughs> pounding the nail and twisting the knife. But isn't it interesting how the standard that God requires, it's a high standard. And, and so often we shrug our shoulders. And, and I think that it's, it's, it's bad to think. We have lowered the, how would I say it? We don't have a fear of the Lord anymore. We don't have a fear of the Lord anymore. It's like, well, can I make money? Is she hot? You know? Um, this, these aren't the questions for the man of God. The man of God has integrity, and uh, the man of God looks a whole lot like the Lord Jesus Christ with conviction that won't bend. Um, we'll, we'll stick with the worthless men today. Worthless men do not know the Lord and disgrace their father. 1 Samuel 2.12, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. If you study these, these uh, sons that Eli had, we'll, we'll, I grabbed a, a couple more verses for some context. It's 1 Samuel 2.22-26. Now Eli, this was, he was the priest. Eli was very old and he, he heard all his sons were doing, what all his sons were doing to all of Israel and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. You can imagine, it's a little bit different, but you can imagine, it's like you have all these girls serving at the church. These guys work at the church and they're sleeping with all the girls that, were, that, that volunteer and help out at the church. God would call those worthless men. <laughs> he does call them worthless men right here. And Eli said to them, why do you do such things? Evil things that I hear from all these people. No, my sons, for the report is not good which I hear the Lord's people circulating. One man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? They would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel was growing in stature in favor with both the Lord and with men. And so what you see there at the end is there is a godly man in the mix. There's this young man, Samuel, who's growing up. And um, God speaks to him and calls him in, in some really cool ways. Worthless men reject God's anointed. Worthless men reject God's anointed. 1 Samuel 10, 27, but certain worthless men said, how can this one deliver us? And they despised him and did not bring him any present. But they kept silent. You can read for more context there, but again, worthless men, they don't care who God's anointed is. They don't care what God is doing. They don't look for where, who God's using and how God might use them. Worthless men don't care about honoring their father. You know, um, some of us had some pretty, pretty nasty fathers, I would say, but there was something redeeming in, in them, some quality, something that we could look to and say, you know what? This is, this is one thing that my dad taught me, if you had any relationship with him at all. And, and you could see Eli's sons like, I don't care what you say. You know, I have an opportunity, and so I'm going to go for it. Um, what we want to do, is, and, I, and I love that you guys call your, your men's ministry lead. We're going to lead in this. We're going to lead. It's like if, if God's men, who are called by his name, we walk around calling ourselves Christian. <laughs> if we can't lead out front, who's going to do it? We're going to turn on the TV, we're going to scroll, and we're going to find the right person. No. No way, man. Uh, worthless men reject God's anointed, but godly men would accept God's anointed, right? Um, especially the Lord Jesus Christ. And we would point people to him, and we would say, hey, he's the one, follow him. Worthless men will not listen to reason and jeopardize those in their care. 
if you were going to do a study on this and you were saying, all right, Ben, we're just hop, skipping, and jumping. I want to dig into this a little bit. I would say take 1 Samuel 25 and read that. Um, you're going to find this man named Nabal. Nabal was definitely a worthless man, but um, 1 Samuel 25, 17 says, Now therefore, uh, know therefore, and consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master and against all his household, and he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. What's happening here with Nabal? I'll just, I'll just kind of deviate for a second. We have a little time. What, what, what Nabal does is he, he's a rich guy, and uh, he's got servants, and he's got a wife and some kids and stuff. And uh, what happens is David and his mighty David and his men are camping outside in these fields around in Nabal's fields. Really, Nabal has sheep. He starts shearing his sheep. When you're doing that, this is a time of kind of celebration. You're kind of seeing uh, it produce, if you will. It, they're they're having the wool and all of that. So there's a celebration time. David says, "Hey, take, tell some of his guys go down and talk to Nabal. We've been guarding his." flocks as I've got this small standing army out here so that nobody messes with any of his stuff since we're camping out around here. Um, we've been kind of doing pulling security for him. Go ask him for some food and stuff like that. So the men go down there. Nabal says, who's David and who's the son of Jesse? In other words, he knows exactly who David is, but he's playing dumb because he knows David's dad. Who's David and who's the son of Jesse? And he sends David's men back. So David's men come back. They said, dude, he you know, and he has some other negative stuff that he says about David. So David's men come back, and, and David's quick response is this. Grab your swords. I love that line. It's a sweet line. I like underlining stuff in my Bible. Grab your swords. <laughs> he takes 400 men. Can I submit to you, 400 armed men can do about anything they want. <laughs> right? It's like, dude, you take 10 guys. And descend on anything in this city. And they're like, yeah, that'd be a big deal, right? 400 men. They leave 200 with all their bags and stuff. And they roll out for Nabal. Well, one of Nabal's servants heard what had happened, the conversation that Nabal had with David's men. And the guy got turned away. And he's like, that ain't good. So he goes to Nabal's wife, Abigail, and says, the master, you know, he's thinking crazy. He did crazy again. We're all going to die. I saw how the guys left here. And, and she, and like some of us, our wives start covering for us and us being stupid. And so she starts, she's like, all right, get a whole bunch of this, get a whole bunch of that, put it on the donkeys and stuff, send them out now. You guys follow them. Let's go get it done or we're going to die today. And um, they meet David and his men on the road. And, and basically be, beg for their lives, and, and David spares them. But the idea with Nabal is, um, you know, he jeopardized everyone in his care. Everyone had to cover for him. And, and the question is, who, who has to cover for you all the time when you're not living as God's man? You know, there's people that we're supposed to watch over. There are people who we provide for. And even if we don't have kids, you know, there are people in this church that, that God would have us invest into. And when we don't live as God's men, we jeopardize those relationships. Uh, when we live for ourselves and we blow all of our money or whatever on that cool next thing that we want, well, I want it. I think it's funny. Anytime my wife gets 10 bucks, she spends it on the family and I get 10 bucks and I burn it up, you know, ordering something stupid online that I forget before it even gets there what it was. It's jeopardizing people in our care. So, Worthless men keep for themselves and do not share what God has given. It's kind of what I just alluded to. First Samuel 30. David came to the 200 men who were too exhausted to follow David. This is kind of an interesting situation where they're going to war. There's some people that um, went to war to battle with them, and some people were left behind. And those who had been left at the brook Bezor they went out to meet David, to meet the people who were with him, and David approached the people, greeted them. When all the wicked and worthless men among those who went with David said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except to every man and to his wife and children, that they may 
lead them away and depart. David said, you must not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us, who has kept us and delivered us into our hands. I'm sorry, delivered us and delivered into our hands the band that came against us. In other words, David's saying, just because they didn't go fight with us and they stayed back, God gave us the victory and we have responsibility over them and we're going to share that with them. We're not going to be worthless men. We're going to be God's men and we're going to share. And when God grants the victory and we have enough money to provide for our family, we're going to share it with the family, right? We're going to share it with our community. We're investing into something. God is making something. Worthless men worked together to destroy others. Two worthless men came and sat before him. And the worthless men t- testified against him. And it goes on. This false testimony, false accusation. The worthless men working together. Uh, this next one is another one of my personal favorites. Worth- worthless men overwhelm good young men. 2 Chronicles 13, 7. And worthless men gathered about him, scoundrels who proved too strong for Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, and when he was young and timid and could not hold his own against them. I think about this, like I worked at a Harley dealership for a while. One of the guys was asking, you just got the shirt or do you ride one? Yeah, I ride one, man. I got one. Um, Sold them for for several years. And And I was in construction for a while too. And, and I remember, and I'm sure you guys will relate to this. You ever be at a workplace, you've been there for a little while, and then the new guy shows up, the new guy's kind of quiet, maybe he's a young guy, and the older guys that have been there for a long time, they're kind of jaded and sideways about life. And they take that young guy, and first, the first thing they got to do is beat him down a little bit, remind him that he knows nothing about what he just stepped into. They got to beat him down, break him down. And then they try to convert him into being a jaded young man instead of a jaded old man. Worthless men overwhelm good young men. When he was young and timid, it could not hold his own against them. I I see this all the time, it seems like, when I was in the workforce. They take the young guy, they tell him how much he doesn't know, they beat him down, and then they turn him into a worthless man like them. And it's like, don't do that, right? We don't do that. That's not manhood. It's a form of manhood. It's worthless man, but unless you're God's man, you're not a man at all. And we'll find that out on that day. I'm, I'm convinced. We'll find that out on our last day when we see the Lord face to face. What kind of man we determined to be with his Holy Spirit inside of us, encouraging us to do what's right when we ignored uh, what he asked us to do. Uh, we're, we're not going to be worthless men, overwhelming good young men. Uh, we, we hold... All of us have a certain opportunities, even in our workplaces, where we can stop that, can't we? Hey, leave him alone. You know, back off of him. Give him a little break. You know, put our arm around that young guy who just showed up and say, "This is how this is how we do it here. This is actually how we're going to do it here." And we can change the change the context and the whole landscape and culture of our workplaces. Um, instead, we'd prefer to fit in. I think, and I don't want to fit in with the worthless men. By God's grace, I was a worthless man, amen? And sometimes I still do worthless things. I want to give him glory. The last one is this. God gives worthless men or unrighteous men over to their desires. It's Romans 1. Romans 1. This is therefore God gave them over in their lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen? Um, pounding the nail on worthless men. This was this is fun for me because, like I said, I'd never heard a worthless man devotional. I'm like everybody's telling me what I need to be, but I never realized how many times I lined up with these worthless guys. I, you know, a lot of guys. Say, oh God, God, He loves everybody. He'd never call a man worthless. God will call a man worthless so fast it'll make your head spin because He created him. You got a son that's doing something that's messed up and you're going to put your arm around him and go, dude, you need to stop now. Like my dad, that's a terrible plan, right? It's not beating him down. It's pointing him in the right direction. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love the worthless men. He wants them to do the right thing. So he sent us Jesus Christ, the perfect example. He's given us his written word and he's expecting us to obey it. It's not like a lot of suggestions, you know, a lot of suggestions, but do it your way. No, he says, I'm, 
You're going to do it my way. What biblical examples of worthless men stuck out to you today and why? Here's what I love. and Jesus Christ can redeem any man. Amen? <laughs> Another word from my dad. Um, I remember when they started giving, you know, in schools and stuff, it's kind of like everything's a pass, you know. It's like, oh, we don't really use letter grades. We use colors. Like, you're pretty good. Everybody's pretty good. And my dad says, you know what's helpful for a young man? Knowing when he failed. Just knowing when he failed, hey, man, that didn't work. You know, uh, don't do that twice because it, it just didn't work. Uh, that's helpful. And so we don't hang our heads in shame. We, we, we learn along the road. And we say, all right, Lord, uh, I did it my way and it didn't work. I'm going to do it your way. Um, that's called repentance, turning and following. And so um, God restores and redeems good, good uh, worthless men into good men. He lifts our heads, the scripture says. Um, and, and he will empower us. He, he plans on using us. That's what, he, that's what he does. So let's pray. And then uh, you guys can have some time at your tables talking about worthless men. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that uh, you saw fit to redeem a whole bunch of worthless men. Because reality is that uh, we're, not, we're not just worthless. We have great value in you. You saw fit to redeem us with your own shed blood. But when we're not living your way, it, it, we are, in effect, worthless. It's like we, we aren't doing what we were created to, to do. We aren't being who we were created to be. God, if there's anyone here today that's just been going their own way and trying so hard with their own wisdom, I pray, Father, that they would repent, that they would just stop, that they would turn to you and look to you for guidance and instruction, that they would acknowledge, Lord, I've been doing it my own way, and I want to do it your way that that emptiness as an empty man, that they would feel restored by your Holy Spirit, Lord, when we turn and we confess and we accept the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ, because you alone are the one who wasn't worthless, uh, that we would be born again. Father, that these men would turn and live uh, victorious lives in you. Father, that they would encourage one another, that the mentoring father would just yield huge results in this community. We're the ones that are here to change this community for your glory. And so, Father, I thank you so much. Thank you for the breakfast, God. Pray, praise you for the hands that uh, made that for us this morning. And Lord, as the men talk in their tables here, would you just encourage them and guide them and refine them uh, for your glory, Lord. We're not gonna puff our chests like we're something great, Lord. You are, so we'll just keep pointing to you. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. If you would like to know more about Kenosha City Church, then check us out online at kenosha.church or on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Kenosha City Church. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, we encourage you to follow us so that you never have to miss an episode. At Kenosha City Church, we are not perfect people, but real people being made new through Jesus.